Psalm 119, beginning at verse 65. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord. According unto thy word, teach me good judgment and knowledge. For I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease. Sounds like some of the problems we have today. But I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they deal perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. This next set of verses in this long and wonderful psalm, I hope you're reading ahead as we look at these things. Three times the psalmist says in these verses that God afflicts. Before you afflicted me, I went astray. Now I've kept your word. It is good for me that you've afflicted me, that I might learn thy statutes. I know, Lord, your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness thou hast afflicted me. that there are times when difficulties, emotional, physical, moral, financial, health-wise, that there are times in our lives when there is affliction and it is allowed to come to us by the hand of God. It looks many different ways, no doubt. It can be through a broken relationship. It can be through physical Suffering, it can be through financial difficulty. Affliction can come from people ganging up on us. Affliction can come from many different things. Moses said, why, Lord, hast thou afflicted me with this great people? That he was peopled out. There were so many of them complaining and unhappy. He said, Lord, they're, they're, I'm afflicted. Hannah had sought the Lord when she was barren and begged God to conceive and said, Lord, you let this affliction come to me. David, when he was leaving Jerusalem and under Absalom's persecution, Shemei was cursing him. And he said, the Lord's raised him up to afflict me. Affliction takes many different forms, many different ways that it comes to us. James says in chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, is any afflicted? Let him pray. Then he says, is any sick? Let him call for the elders. So James draws a line between affliction and sickness. So, so we can't always think that all sickness is affliction. God allows sometimes, certainly Job was afflicted by Satan and God gave permission in that circumstance. But all illness is not affliction. Some of it's just because of the fall. Some of it is something we've earned through stupidity. But the psalmist, the singer is saying here, Lord, you've allowed affliction in my life because before that came, I went astray. Now, that's the story of all of our lives. We had all gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone's gone to his own way. That's happened to all of us. 
And I think before we're saved, we're astray. It takes us a while to realize that. And as a believer, we can backslide. We can become a prodigal and go astray again from the ways of God that are clearly revealed to us. I think before we're saved, it may take some time. Because before you're saved, you tailor your life to fit in with a certain group of people and a certain standard of behavior. And you do that... uh, So you can be cool before I was saved. I even thought I was cool. I hung around with cool people who did cool things. Therefore, I must be cool. But that gets hollow. It wears out. You keep the facade on because you have to fit in. At the same time, you know you're lying to yourself. God is gracious to wear us out and he lets affliction come in one form or another and all of that stuff becomes quite hollow. We realize there's a gaping hole inside. I'm not happy and I'm not fulfilled and I'm laughing and carrying on and acting a certain way and I have my act together, but that's all it is. It's an act because inside I am empty and I'm tired of the hollowness and I'm looking for something more meaningful than this and this can't be all there is. Because this is not cool, this is stupid. We get there. And God awakens us through some thing that brings us to the path that our feet should be on. He does it as Christians if we turn away. God is gracious to chasten, not to punish, to chasten us. We're his children, he loves us. To take hold of our life through some difficulty, to awaken us again, and to get our feet back on the path where it should be. Because our course needs to be corrected. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. I was on the wrong path. I was headed in the wrong direction. And Lord, you allowed something to come in my life to readjust my compass and to put my life going in the right direction. Lord, because you love me. It says you've dwelt well with me, uh, uh, dealt well with me. Verse 65, thou hast dealt well with thy servant. And in hindsight, he's saying, Lord, it was in faithfulness that you afflicted me. You, you allowed these things to happen because I was gone astray. And you let them come into my life so that then I could correct the direction of my life so my life could be worth something. I think confession has to be part of that. We have to be willing to say, I was gone astray. My life was meandering. It was without purpose. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were all gone according to the course of this world. We were blown by the winds of this world like a weather vane. And we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. We meandered, it says. And before we came to Christ, our life was meandering. It was without purpose. It was determined our direction and the way we dress, what we listen to, everything we did was determined by the standards of this world and we were driven by that. And we were dead in trespasses and sins. And through one circumstance or another, the Lord wakes us up. And we take inventory. And we look around. And we realize how empty things are. And he redirects our course and he puts our feet back on the path again. The lie is this, and and the problem with affliction is that too often we listen to Satan tell us, God doesn't love you. That's why this is happening. He no longer loves you. You've got some secret sin in your life, and then you start to examine yourself. Is it because of this? Is it because of that? Because we can find enough stuff if we want to measure ourselves that way. And it leads to depression. It leads to despair. And we start to believe that difficult things are happening in our life because God is angry and he's getting us. That he doesn't love us. And we buy into that. The psalmist is saying, no, Lord, in hindsight, thou hast dealt well with thy servant. You did what was right in my life. According to your word, you were faithful. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Teach me what is right, Lord. So important. Last night at Kirk's memorial service, as, as, oh, what a glorious time, and the sanctuary was full, and so many were here to remember him, and, but so young, so tragic, so young. But we forget that it happens 
10,000 times over every day around this world that a 40-year-old or a 30-year-old or a 20-year-old is snapped out of this life. That we don't necessarily have 70 years, that we don't have, that, that we have to take inventory. Where are we headed? What course are we on? And I listened and I watched and I thought, Lord, there are things being spoken here that are not being articulated in human language. Lord, I'm going to go home and take another look at my kids because I don't know how many days I have to see them, to embrace them, to tell them that I love them. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, Lord, to affirm them, to tell them what I appreciate about what they're doing. To look closely at my wife again and how hard she works, her service to the Lord, and just to reaffirm that. Because I can tend to sit quietly and not say. I mean, with a wife and four kids, there's enough verbiage floating around the house that there's no lack of, you don't really need somebody else to say something else. There's always be something being said, and usually I'm happy like that. I can veg for decades. But open your mouth. Reaffirm things. Teach me good judgments. Teach me, Lord. Let me reprioritize. Let me see. Let me take inventory. Before you afflicted me, I went astray. Now, though, I've kept your word. I'm listening, Lord. Redirect my path. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy said, Lord, because you are good, you can only do good things. My perspective was out of whack because I figured because these kind of things were happening that you weren't good, that you didn't love me, that you were angry with me. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're not saved and you're thinking, if there is a God, I don't want to know him. If there's a God and he's all powerful and he controls everything and he's letting this kind of stuff go on in my life or in my family's life or on the news, if he's really there, then I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell because I don't even want to know who he is. And we can believe that lie because it's out there and it's poisonous. And it's toxic and it kills. Or we can step back and say, Lord, you allow affliction. Comes in different ways. But it's always come, Lord, to direct the path of someone who's gotten off course. Because you do love them and you'd rather see them in difficulty to be reoriented than to go on without any problems to eternal death. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, Our light affliction, which is for a moment, worketh for us a far more eternal, exceeding weight of glory. While we look, not at the things that are seen, the things that are not seen. Because if we look at the things that are seen, they're temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. Paul says, you know, we find ourselves renewed every day. The outward man is perishing. Yes, it's a struggle. But the inward man is renewed day by day. Paul needed that daily renewal. He wasn't like the energizer bunny charged up on the road to Damascus and never needed encouragement again. He said daily we have to be renewed. And this light affliction... Light affliction. He said they were despairing of life itself. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was, you know, this light affliction, he says, which is for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. And we're renewed day by day while we keep our eyes on those things that are eternal. Before you afflicted me, Lord, I went astray. But now... I've kept your word, and you're good, and you do good. The proud have forged a lie against me. Of course, Satan's fall by pride. He is the father of lies. The proud have forged a lie against me. God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. How can you call yourself a Christian? All the trouble in your life, all the pain in your life, and you worship this God? The proud have forged a lie against me. But I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart, in contrast to mine, is as fat as grease. Imagine that, a big old fat, greasy heart. The guy needs some fiber, whoever he is, I'll tell you that. Fatness in the scripture is not 
like fatness in our society today. We have all kinds of ways of unfattening ourselves. If we just all stop eating, we wouldn't have such a problem. There's countries around the world where everybody's thin because there's not enough food. What we want to do is we want to eat like someone who will never gain weight and stay thin at the same time. So we've got all kinds of machines, clubs, pills, patches, all kinds of stuff. Kaido this and Kaido that and traps all the fat and takes it right through your system and just pig out and not have any consequences. It's wonderful. You know, because what we want to do is we want to eat like two hoagies and then take a pill that causes a nuclear reaction and just dissolves the atomic structure of everything we just ate and just makes it disappear. Or, or we have some way of balancing, you know, we, we put sweet and low in our coffee so we can have ice cream on our pie and then some, there's something that happens there that balances everything out there. Well, in the Old Testament, fatness was a sign of God's blessing and of his prosperity. Fatness spoke of health and blessing. But this speaks of someone whose heart is as fat as grease. And when you break down the language, it's speaking about someone who's indulgent. Someone whose heart is so carnally inclined, that's all they want to do is those things that are sensual. And they want to sin. And because people love that position. See, Jesus said, people don't come to the light because they love darkness more than light. And it's very interesting. He says there, they agape darkness more than light. That the unsaved man exercises agape in that he is devoted to darkness, the way a Christian should be devoted to Christ. And someone who doesn't come to the light because they don't want their deeds to be made manifest, they are devoted to darkness. They love the darkness and they want to indulge themselves because their heart is as fat as grease. So they forge a lie. And they work deception because they want, to, they want to substantiate their own position. And they want to find enough people to hang around with to believe what they believe to reinforce what they believe because they don't really believe what they believe. You know what I mean. You did that. This singer says, their heart is as fat as grease. They're indulgent. They're carnal. But Lord, I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Lord, it makes me teachable. Let's not look at each other like we don't understand. Some difficulty comes in our life and it slows us down. It stops us in our tracks. We sit down again and for the first time, we're not just saying Lord, we're saying, oh Lord. There's the O oh is back in our vocabulary again. Oh Lord. Lord, this morning I'm getting up for devotions. You remember when we used to have those? Speak to me, Lord. Give me something from your word. My heart is broken. My body is broken. This person I love is broken in some way. This situation is failing. It's falling apart. I'm struggling. Speak to me, Lord. You've made me teachable again. You have dealt well with thy servant. Because before this affliction came, I was going astray. And now you've taught me to walk in your word again. You've renewed me. It is good for me that you've afflicted me, Lord. That I might become teachable again and learn your statutes. Because your word, Lord, verse 72... The law of thy mouth is better to to me than thousands of gold or silver. Thousands of gold or silver what? Doesn't matter, does it? Who cares? Thousands of gold, anything, I'll take. Your word, Lord, is more important to me than the wealth of this world. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? 
Abraham was a man who set his heart upon God. It tells in chapter 13 of Genesis, he was overloaded with gold or silver. I've never had that experience. What's it mean to be overloaded with gold and silver? And Abraham never built a mansion. He was a man who lived in tents, looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Never meant anything to him. He comes back from the battle of the the kings with Chedorlaomer and the five kings of the north and meets Melchizedek and then the prince of Sodom comes and wants to give to Abraham and Abraham said, I'm not going to touch a shoe latchet of this stuff. I don't want any of it. I don't need it. And God then appears and said, Lord, I'm, Abraham, I'm your, your exceeding great reward. Abraham didn't need any of it. Achan, on the other side of the coin, in Joshua chapter 7, steals gold and silver in a Babylonian garment, hides it in his tent when God had said, all of this needs to be dedicated to me. And it infected the whole camp. It's the same now. You know, I don't know about you, but I want my four kids around somebody that are characterized by the fact that the Word of God is more important to them than any treasure in this world. That's why I want my sons hanging around. That's why I want my daughters hanging around. That's who I want to rub shoulders with. Because when somebody finds this world and the treasures of this world more important than they give their life, they infect other people. They affect the whole camp. And they infect others. This psalmist, you know, is just, this singer has been brought to his senses. And he says, Lord, you have dealt well with your servant, according to your word. I was headed in another direction. Uh, Lord, I wasn't learning your judgments. I was going astray, and you afflicted me. And Lord, it brought my feet back on the path again. And you're good. You can only do what's good. There are those around me who are forging a lie, Lord. They're coming after me. Their heart is as fat as grease. They're carnal. They're sensual. But it's good that you've afflicted me because you made me teachable again. You brought me back to your word. I remember how wonderful it is, Lord, even in difficulty. And it's more precious to me than gold and silver. Verse 73 says, you've made me with your hands. I'm handmade, Lord. I wasn't made on the assembly line. Not here by mistake. I'm not the product of uh, tens of millions of fortuitous concurrences. I'm not pond slime struck by lightning. I'm handmade. And because I'm handmade, you know what's best for me. Give me understanding. Give me knowledge. You know, we have a drawer at home in our house that's filled with manuals and schematics for the television, for the washing machine. For the dishwasher, for the radio alarm clocks, for the blender. I hate that drawer. I hate those manuals. (laughs) Like they could help you. (laughs) Last week we were moving the living room around. I had to take like the television, all the stuff out of the (laughs) cabinet in the living room to move the cabinet. Kathy decided the cabinet needed to be on the other end of the living room for just just I didn't see it initially I see it now I see it now but I didn't see it initially and I was trying to take the VCR out and it's got all this stuff connected to the back which I did a long time ago and just and just and I, and something was falling and I stepped back and it jerked this one cord out that was screwed in and pulled out a big piece of the back of the VCR <laughs> I wasn't happy <laughs> I decided then and there to spite the VCR and get a DVD player That's what I did. <laughs> and then you get there and a guy says, what kind of TV do you have? I don't know. <laughs> this one. <laughs> no. How old is it? Ten years old. Oh. Well, those old TVs don't understand DVD language. So you need this to sit between and this will interpret for your old dumb television <laughs> what dvd is trying to say and the price is going up and up you know so but but you know i get home and then just i unpack that stuff put it on the floor take the manuals and throw it to my 23 year old daughter and say here do this (laughs) 
It's wonderful. I, I used to wonder why my dad did that to me. Now I know. Just I pay for it. If you want to watch it, you figure it out and you look it up. <laughs> but there's always an owner's manual. There is here, too. That's what he's saying. You made me with your hands. Handmade, Lord. Miracle in each one of us sitting here. No reason for you to be anything but a blob of cells. Scientists have no idea why every cell in your body with the same information, some cells all of a sudden decide to become bone, some decide to become nerve, some decide to become eyeballs and organs, and why nerve endings and blood vessels can go to an area before the organ even develops there, waiting for it. They have no idea how all that happens. Well, we do. We're handmade. It says it right here. The Lord fashioned us. Because of that, there's an owner's manual. There's a book. And we function best according to the book. I mean, look, you buy a new DVD and it's not working, right? You're sitting there looking, I can't believe I bought this thing. I want to watch this DVD. And here's, I can't read it. It's so complicated. I can't believe. And you're willing to sit there for hours. What about when you're afflicted? You're having a problem. You sit down with your Bible and say, I just want to know the right thing to do, Lord. This is the owner's manual. And it's not working right. It told me how to hook this up here. I want to be able to, you know. We do that with our own lives. There's an owner's manual. He says in verse 75, I know, Lord, that your judgments are right. I know that. If there's some difficulty, some struggle in my life, you've allowed it, I know that that's right. And that in faithfulness, thou hast afflicted me. Lord, you know that affliction puts my feet back on the path. You know that affliction makes me teachable. And therefore, because of who you are, you will then do that faithfully. In faithfulness, thou hast afflicted me. And then five lets. That, that's how he ends here. There's five requests, beginning of verse 76. Because God is faithful. Because God puts our feet back on the path. before He makes us teachable again. Because, verse 65, he's dealt well with us as his servants according to his word. Therefore, Lord, let I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Verse 77, here's the next let. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live for thy law is my delight. 78. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. 79. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Lastly, let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I might not be ashamed. Lord, I know that you're good, Lord. Things are back in perspective. I was griping, I was complaining, I was struggling. But I've discovered that all of that caused me to take inventory and reprioritize and look at the really important things in life. It made me seek you again and read your word again. And I realized that I was going astray. And you used those difficulties. You allowed them to hone me, to teach me, to refine me, and to put my feet back on the path again. And it's good, Lord, that you did that. Because I've become teachable once again. You've, dwelt, you've dealt well with your servant, Lord. You are good. You only do good. Oh, there's lots of lies that surround me that would try to turn me away from that. But Lord, I know it's true. You made me, with, fashioned me with your own hands. Let me then, according to knowledge and understanding, Lord, walk with you again. I know that your judgments are right. Therefore, Lord, it's in faithfulness that you've afflicted me. You have been faithful to keep my feet on the path. You have been faithful to keep me teachable. Therefore, Lord, let I pray thee thy merciful kindness be for my comfort. Lord, comfort me, but according to your word. Don't let me find comfort the way worldly people find comfort. And Christians are tempted in difficult circumstances to cast the word of God aside, to get angry at God. This is you can't believe you're letting this happen to me. And just step away from the word of God and find some temporary comfort in sin or in compromise 
It says Moses chose rather to suffer the reproach of Christ than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The Bible is clear that sin is pleasurable. That's why the Bible warns us about sin. The Bible doesn't say don't stick a toothpick in your eye over and over again. Because nobody would do that. But it warns us about sin because we're inclined to that. It's pleasurable for a season. Lord, let me find comfort, but according to your word. Let it be within the parameters of your word, Lord. Let that be something that's real in my life. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I might live. Not just your let me have mercy, not just mercies, plural, but your tender mercies. So different from the position of a deist who said, oh yeah, there's God out there. He said everything in the motion in the beginning. He's just whistling now, watching it all spin through the universe and decompensate. No, no, the Bible knows nothing of a God like that. Or maybe the God of the Aztecs and the Incas that think God is only satisfied by human blood. No, no. This is a God who stoops down to exercise in the lives of sinners, saved by grace, like you and I, tender mercies that we might live. He stoops down and he loves us more than any earthly father or mother loves their children. Let your tender mercies come to me, Lord, that I might live. For thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed. Lord, vindicate me. For they deal, dealt perversely with me without a cause. I will meditate in thy precepts. Lord, deal with them, Lord. I, I'm keeping my feet on the course. I want to do what's right. You deal, Lord, with the proud. Vindicate me. Let those that fear thee turn unto me. Lord, you, you've let me find comfort according to your word in difficulty. You've strengthened me. You've extended your tender mercies. You've vindicated me. Let those who fear thee turn to me, Lord. Let me be a testimony. Second Corinthians chapter 1. The God of all comfort, the Father of all mercy, that he comforts us in our affliction, that we might be able to comfort others in their affliction with the same comfort we were comforted with. Let those that fear thee come to me, Lord, so that I can tell them what you've done. That you've dealt well with your servant, that you are good, that difficulties are not to destroy, they're to strengthen and to hone and to make us into mature men and women of God, who love your word more than the treasures of this world, who are not sitting around listening to the lies of those who are sensual and carnal, who are trying to reinforce their position by lying about God. Lord, you've made me by hand, and your ma owner's manual is the best thing to guide my life, and I know you will be faithful, Lord, to keep me teachable and to keep my path, your path before me. So, Lord, then let these things happen. And let, Lord, lastly, my heart be sound in thy statutes. Let my heart be healthy, Lord, and whole in your statutes, in your truth. Let it happen, Lord. Because the singer knows that the heart is the center of the human being, not the intellect, the heart, where desire dwells, where the compass is set, where the course of life is born, where the issues of life come forth, the heart. Let my heart, Lord, be sound in thy statutes. What a great prayer. That's great bumper sticker stuff. You should all get a bumper sticker that says that. Then you have to drive right too, you know. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, and I will not be ashamed. Great prayer. I know that there are some of you here that are going through circumstances, wondering, God, are you angry with me? Are you getting me? God does not get his children. He chastens the son that he loves. In the present, that is not a pleasurable experience, but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I know that God is not getting you because 2,000 years ago on a wooden cross, he got his son in your place 
with all of your sin upon him. And it was dealt with once and for all. And the difficulties that God allows to come in our life now, they don't come as punitive movements of God. He's not punishing. He's guiding. He's refining. He's honing. I'm not talking, you know, we may separate out from their sickness that just comes in life because of sin and because the world has fallen. You know, there are difficult things that come, but there are times when God afflicts. That word, when you study through the Old Testament, sometimes it's translated, he humbles. Sometimes he chastens. He causes us to think. God afflicts. The way that we afflict our children, instructing Directing. No, you can't do that. No, if you do that, you'll end up injured. You'll end up infected. You'll destroy your life. You'll ruin your future. God loves us more. There are tough lessons for us to learn, but they come to put our feet back on the path, to readjust our internal compass again, to make us teachable. They come to us in his faithfulness because he loves us. He knows what we're made of because he wove us together. And to him, all of our lives are written out before any of them are lived. He knows the warp and the woof of our personality, our reins. Psalm 139 tells us, that before we were born, he knew. He gives us the owner's manual because he knows how we were made to flourish and what parameters we were made to flourish in. And that's all he desires for us.